Well, good evening, Porch. How are we doing tonight? Hey, it's uh, so good to see you. My name is Timothy Atik. I'm one of the teaching pastors here at Watermark. I want to give a huge shout out to some of our Porch Live locations. We've got Porch Live Fort Worth, Porch Live Boise, Porch Live Des Moines, and Porch Live Scottsdale. So glad that you guys are tuning in tonight. And then we've got a lot of people right here in Dallas, and so glad that you guys are here as well. So uh, several years ago, almost a decade ago, I was the executive director of a ministry in Waco called Vertical Ministries, which is a ministry on the campus of Baylor University, and Vertical met on Monday nights, and hundreds of students would gather together, kind of like what we're doing now, to worship and to study the Bible together. And one of the perks of doing ministry at Baylor was the third floor of the Baylor Library was all uh, spiritual books, which is really helpful for someone like me. So they had every resource that I could ever want. So I did a lot of my work from the third floor of the Baylor Library. And uh, I will never forget this one time that I went up to work at Baylor's library. I went up and it was during finals week, and so the library was packed. Usually it was easy to find a space. On this particular day, I had to take a lap around the entire floor. So I started going to my left, and I walked all the way around until I finally found one place to sit. And when I sat down, I'm going to be honest, I was a little disappointed because I entered the library with some pride in my heart. I thought, you know what, I speak to hundreds of students every Monday night, I'm going into the library as the vertical guy, so I'm sure that as I walk and find my seat, there's gonna be students who are waving and smiling, they wanna pull me aside and tell me how I changed their life, and I got to my seat and no one said a thing, no one looked up, no one gave me a wave, and I sat down, I was very disappointed, and as I sat down, something very interesting happened. Because as I sat on my seat, I looked on the seat and there was this uh, stream of toilet paper on my seat. I was like, that's so interesting. And so I began to trace the toilet paper to its origin and it was the back of my pants. And so what I realized is I had just taken a lap around Baylor's third floor with a string of toilet paper about this long hanging out of my pants. And in that moment, who I thought I was and who I actually was collided. Because <laughs> I went to the library thinking I was the cool vertical guy. And then when I got to the library and experienced what I did, I realized I wasn't the cool vertical guy. I was the creepy old man who didn't know how to take care of business correctly. And who I was and who I thought I was collided in, in that moment. And it was a humbling moment, very humbling moment, as this 30-something-year-old man in a sea of college students sat there at his desk, flustered, unable to concentrate. Finally, I just packed up and left without the toilet paper. But I tell you that because as we step into the scriptures tonight, we are concluding our series that we've been calling The Return, Living Like Jesus is Coming Back. And as we step into the scriptures, we're actually going to look at a passage where we see what things will be like on the final day. Like when Jesus actually comes back, we get a vision of what we can, what we can expect. And what I think that we're going to see in the passage that we're going to look, look at is it is going to be a moment of cosmic clarification where many of us for the first time on that day when Jesus comes back, it will take until then for us to realize who we thought we were and who we actually are. See, if I were to sit down and I were to ask you, hey, who are you? You know what you would start telling me? You would start telling about me about what you figured out about how you're wired. You'd be like, I'm an Enneagram 3 wing 2, or I'm an ENFJ, whatever the letters are. I'm super extroverted. I'm not. Like, you would tell me about your wiring, but, but those are just things that inventories are, 
or tests have told you. And there's something way more true about you. You have been made to see Jesus as the one and only true God, and you've been made to worship him. And yet some of us are going to get to that last day where Jesus is going to come back, and you know what we're going to realize? We're going to realize, we're going to look back, and we're going to realize that we spent so much of our lives trying to either be God or replace God. And you might sit there and be like, when have I ever tried to be God? Well, let me ask you, when have you ever called the shots in your own life? When have you, when have you ever said, I am going to date this person even if it's not the best person for me to date. This is where I'm going to work even if I have to cut corners. I'm going to spend more money than I make because this is just what I want. When have you ever insisted on your own way? If you've ever insisted on your own way or you've bought into the philosophy that, you know what, I just need to find my truth and you need to find your truth and whatever truth is good for you, that's great, and whatever truth is good for me is fine for me. Do you know what you're doing? You are trying to be God we will realize that we've spent so much time either trying to be God or replace God. And so my hope today is that we wouldn't have to wait to that moment to get crystal clarity. Because in that moment, when we have that realization and we see Jesus for all that he is, and in that moment we realize what we've actually been made for, which is to worship him, in that moment, for many, it will be a very humbling moment. But we don't have to wait till then for that humbling moment to come. Right now, we can come to grips with who we are and who he is. And we can begin to respond rightly now to who he is now. And so that's my hope tonight. Because I want to be clear. There is only one God. And we are not him. And so it is good for us to realize that humility is a key to eternity. It is. Humility is a key to eternity. You cannot experience eternity with Jesus Christ without humility towards him. So if you have a Bible, I want to invite you to turn with me tonight to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 2 is where we are going to be. Isaiah chapter 2. Interestingly, yesterday morning, I woke up thinking that I was going a completely different direction direction with the message. And in my personal time with the Lord, in my Bible reading, I'm going through the book of Isaiah, and yesterday I read Isaiah chapter 2, and I just sensed in my heart that this is where the porch needs to be. As we talk about the return, this series, as we bring it to conclusion, it feels like this passage could not be a better fit as it discusses the day when Jesus Christ will come back. And as we look at this passage, what we're going to see is the prophet Isaiah is going to encourage the nation of Israel to do two things. And my encouragement is that, is that we would do these two things as well. Here's what we're going to see. Two things. Number one, exalt the God who will be exalted. Exalt the God who will be exalted. And number two, humble yourself before you are humbled. Humble yourself before you are humbled. So let's, let's start with the first, first one. First word of encouragement is this. Exalt the God who will be exalted. When I use the word exalt, what I'm talking about is I'm talking about raising God's rank in your life. I'm, I'm talking about Jesus ranking higher than anyone or anything else to you. I'm talking about Jesus taking first place in your life and everything else being a distant second. Because a day is coming when God will be revealed as greater than anyone or anything. So look with me at Isaiah chapter 2, verse 1. It says, the word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah in Jerusalem, it shall come to pass in the latter days. That in the Hebrew, it means the culmination of days. So what we're looking at right here is what we can expect at the culmination of days, the days, the day when Jesus Christ will come back. It will come to pass in the latter days. 
that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. So don't miss what I'm telling you right now. In the ancient Near East, mountains were very important in various religions because mountains were considered to be the places where heaven met earth. And mountains were considered the dwelling places of the gods. And so what Isaiah is reminding Israel of is on that day when God is revealed and we see God for who he is, God's mountain will dwarf any other mountain. All other mountains will just fade away. And God will be seen as the one and only true God. He will be seen as preeminent, that there is no one in nothing that rivals God. So here's what that means. If the Bible is correct, then when Jesus comes back, there is going to be this cosmic clarification where we will find out that there has only been one true God, and when his majesty and his splendor is revealed in such a way that every eye on the planet will see him, we will realize that all along, every single day of our lives, he was the only one who deserved our greatest allegiance and affection and adoration and obsession. Do you realize that that day is coming where you have the perspective that no one deserved allegiance, affection, adoration, or your obsession like Jesus did. Anyone or anything else that we have exalted or ranked above God will seem infinitely insignificant in that moment. So the question is, what does it look like now for us to begin to exalt him? What does it look like for us to live now how we will live for all of eternity? One of the best things we can do is begin to live how we will live in heaven. We should live that way now. If we will spend eternity exalting God, we should spend the rest of our time on earth exalting God. If he will take first place in our lives in heaven, he should take first place in our lives on earth. But first, we have to identify what do we tend to exalt above God. I'm going to show you something that I'm probably going to regret. My uh, freshman year in college, I was in a dating relationship, and I still have the mementos from that relationship. Now, the question is going to surface in your mind. Why do you still have that stuff? So here's the reality. Um, It was in my parents' house for years. And I looked up in the closet and I saw it. I was like, that'd be a great sermon illustration. My mom never threw it away when she was cleaning out. And I was married. My wife knew that I took it. Like, I'm not at home like, my precious. Like, it's not like that. All right. So just to be clear, I'm not a freak. I'm not a weirdo. Like, this is just, it's just, I had it. So, and if you're the girl and at some point you see this, I'm sorry. I promise I'm happily married, like, I'm not, anyway, okay. Uh, This was a beanie baby that she gave me. She sprayed it with her perfume so I could, you know what I'm saying. So there was that. Uh, This right here was a, this is called a mouse pad when we used to need mice for our computers. It was a baseball glove. I didn't play baseball, but there was a collage of her pictures that I could always See her, so that's that. This is a pillow that uh, we have a picture of the two of us ironed onto. So yeah, that's great. Um, This unfortunately broke, but for you young people, uh, this is called a CD, a compact disc. It's titled, For My Perfect Boyfriend. That's this guy. And then, uh, this will make you throw up in your mouth. And uh, <laughs> some of you guys went to A&M and you're like, not this again. God help me. But uh, um, this, to be clear, I made this. <laughs> and this is so dumb. This is, 
a printout of every, don't judge me, <laughs> of every message conversation. Hey, therapy has been super helpful. <laughs> now, <laughs> let's just pray and get out of here. I, that's just... So, question. The disappointment in your faces, like, it is, it's real. Question. And if you've seen this and know the answer, don't yell it out. How long do you think we dated? Two months. I heard you, two months. Two months, yep. Now, don't miss this. Don't miss this. Some of y'all are like, are you kidding me? He is crazy. Um, here's what I can say confidently. What I can say with absolute certainty is that for those two months, that girl was without a doubt my God. And I was a follower of Jesus Christ at the time, but for those two months, she was hands down, without a doubt, my God. She got all of my time. She got all of my attention. She received all of my affection. She was, for those two months, my obsession. And you can sit there and judge me, and I don't blame you at all. I show you that to get you laughing before I turn it back on you and say, you might not have all this junk to show for it, but what's in your bag? What's in your bag? Who or what are you exalting above God? What's your greatest allegiance to? What do you adore the most? What gets the majority of your affection? What is your obsession? Like, what do you lay awake at night thinking about? What do you lose sleep over? What stirs your heart in a way that Jesus never has? Maybe it's working out. Maybe it's your body. Maybe it's just, that's just all you can think about is how you look. Maybe it's your car. Maybe it's money. Maybe it's social media. Maybe it's constantly having plans on the weekend. Maybe it's the pursuit of the American dream. Maybe it's busyness, so you always feel important. Maybe it's having letters after your name, like MD or PhD. Maybe it's an influencer that you just hang on everything they say or do. It could be a pastor. It concerns me when I hear people are like, Ben said, Jenny said, JP said. I'm like, do you care more about hearing from them than God himself? And so it's just good for us to ask, what do we exalt more than Christ? What takes first place in your life, in mine? Do you want to know the realization that I had as I just thought about all this stuff? Do you know what I felt once I got out of the relationship and got perspective? I felt embarrassment. I felt embarrassment that I had such a strong obsession in such a short period of time. My fear is that some of us are going to eventually see Jesus face to face and in that moment what we're going to realize is that we had far too weak of an affection for far too long of a period of time. C.S. Lewis puts it this way. He says, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered us. Like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at sea. We are far too easily pleased. Some of us, we, we lay in bed at night restless. Do you know what's happening? Is your soul is longing for the one for whom it's been created, Jesus. Amen. He's the only one who can satisfy the deepest longings 
of your soul. I said this on the first week of the series, so I just want to say it again. Don't wait until you see Jesus to finally see Jesus. Don't wait until you see Jesus to finally see Jesus. Don't wait for that day for Christ to finally be exalted. Today is the day for him to take first place in everything else to take a distant second. So you might ask, well, what does it look like for Christ to be exalted in my life? Well, here's the good news is if we keep reading in Isaiah chapter 2, what we get is we get a picture of that day when Christ comes back. And what we see is we see people exalting Christ, and it's very instructive. So look with me back at the text. It says at the end of verse 2, and all the nations shall flow to it. Flow to what? To the mountain of God. Verse 3, and many people shall come and say, come, let us go up the mountain of the Lord to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall decide disputes for many peoples. And they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation shall not lift up sword against nation. Neither shall they learn war any more. So do you see what we see there? We see that a day is coming where a magnitude of universal proportions of people will be seeking and hungering for God. There will be people from every tribe, tongue, and nation, every people group who are seeking after God. And as they seek for God, how will Christ be exalted? Well, they will hunger for him. They will want to see him and behold him. They will want to learn from him. His word will be supremely authoritative in their lives. His ways will be the only true way. That's what it looks like to exalt Christ now. It's for you to position your life to where you consistently gaze at Jesus Christ, for you to see him for who he truly is. It's it's waking up each morning and coming to his word and saying, Jesus, I want to see you in your word. I want to learn from you. You have a right to speak into my life. Your ways are the best ways. I choose you, Jesus, about anything else in my life. Your way is the best way. You, Jesus, have a right to rule in my heart and in my life. That's what it looks like to exalt Christ. And what we see is a day is coming where Jesus' rule will be realized throughout the earth. That's why you see the, the spears are turned into, or swords are turned into to pruning hooks or into plowshares. What is that imagery? It's that items are of war become farming tools because Eden in some way will be restored. Paradise will be restored. And we will have the privilege of spending all of eternity in the presence of Jesus. Here's here's what you need to know. One thing that I see happening, especially with young adults, it happened with my group of friends coming out of Texas A&M, is sometimes we take intermissions between Jesus being Savior and Jesus being Lord. And so we want Jesus to save us from our sin, but we don't necessarily want Jesus to save us into a new life with him where he begins to lead us and direct us and call the shots. And so we want Jesus to be savior and it's like, yes, I'm so thankful that you are my ticket into heaven. But Jesus isn't just savior, he's also king. What do kings do? Kings rule. He's given you his word so you can know his ways. He's given you his spirit because his spirit wants to make you more like him. So here's what you need to know. When Jesus Christ went to the cross, when he sacrificed himself, when he endured the wrath of God for your sins and mine, when he walked out of the grave victoriously, he didn't just do it to get you into heaven. He did it to get heaven into you now. He wants to make you more like him now. And that happens by us beginning to exalt him, by allowing him to take first.
place. If you're here tonight and you're not a follower of Jesus Christ, you're not a Christian, someone invited you, let me just say, I'm so glad you're here. The porch will always be a place where people who don't know Jesus can come and just explore and ask questions and, and figure it out. But you might have just heard me say that a day is coming where, where God, the God where Jesus is God, will one day be shown to be the only true God. And maybe you have believed in another religion or another God and what I'm saying is confusing to you or frustrating to you. Here's what I would just say to you. We, we live in a world right now where, where we want to act like heaven is kind of a ski mountain and, and there's a bunch of different lifts to get to heaven. And so as long as you find your way to the top and I find my way to the top, it really doesn't matter because they all end in the same place. But here's what every religion, here's the question every religion needs to answer. How do we imperfect people get to be with a perfect God? How do we down here, imperfect people, get up there with a perfect God in a perfect place, heaven? It's impossible. No matter how hard you try to get to him, you will always be imperfect. See, the good news of the gospel is that God came down the mountain to get us. Jesus Christ left heaven and came to earth. The eternal word of God took on flesh, Jesus Christ. He lived a perfect life. He died in our place. He conquered death. Why? So that he could take imperfect people with him to heaven. And his perfection would be our entrance. And his perfection would be what sustains us for all of eternity. Do you know him? If you don't, then let me just encourage you to be careful with the idea of, you know what, I'll just find my own truth. Here's what you have to remember. Just because you believe something doesn't mean it's true. Your beliefs have no bearing on truth, okay? And so you can believe it, but that doesn't mean it's true. Finding your own truth might bring you comfort temporarily, but cannot support you for eternity. If the Bible is true, a day is coming when it will be revealed that there is only one true God. And that one true God has been deserving of your greatest affection every day of your life and will be for all of eternity. So the first thing is exalt the God. The God where Jesus is God, exalt the God who will be exalted. And then number two, humble yourselves before you are humbled. Humble yourselves before you are humbled. Do you know what pride is? Pride is the posture of your life and heart when you have an inflated view of God, uh, when you have an inflated view of self due to a deflated view of God. That's what pride is. Pride is the posture of your life and heart when you have an inflated view of yourself and a deflated view of God. Humility is the reverse. An inflated view of God, which breeds a deflated view of self. He is great, we are not. He is God, we are not. And so look at what Isaiah chapter 2 verse 5 says. It says, O house of Jacob, come, let us walk in the light of the Lord. What is the light of the Lord? It is what gives us guidance and direction. There's going to be a contrast here because Isaiah goes on and says, For you, that's God has rejected your people, the nation of Israel, the house of Jacob. Why? Because they are full of things from the east. The sun rises in what? The east. Some of you are like, not sure. The east. <laughs> and so what Isaiah is saying is, hey, you, you guys are looking to the light of the world instead of the light of God. What he's doing is he's calling them out and saying, you're looking within, you're looking under the sun for life instead of looking beyond the sun to God for your direction. You're full of things from the east and of fortune tellers like the Philistines. He's saying you're, you're relying on human ingenuity and they strike hands with the children of foreigners. He's saying you guys are learning and you're taking pages from the playbooks of people who do not know God. And so what's the result? The result is pride. 
the result is pride because what the nation of Israel is guilty of doing is they are trying to be God. How are they trying to be God? Because they're saying, you know what? We can figure out life on our own under the sun. We can use human ingenuity to figure out the best way. They're looking at other people who don't know God and learning from them and they're saying, you know what? We can do this without God. They're trying to be God. And not only are they trying to be God, they're trying to replace God. He goes on in verse seven and says, their land is filled with silver and gold and there's no end to their treasures. They were looking to material wealth and stuff to be their God. Their land is filled with horses and there's no end to their chariots. They were looking to security to be their God. Their land is filled with idols. They bow down to the work of their hands, to what their own fingers have made. They, they're looking to um, man-made religion to be their God. They are actually making gods and finding their fulfillment in them. That's what they're doing. And the crazy thing is that not much has changed in the thousands of years since the book of Isaiah was written. So let me just ask you to just look at me real quick and answer this question. We'll even have it on the screen. Just fill in the blank. If I only had what, then I would be happy. What is it? Just fill in the blank. If I only had what, what is it? Then you would be happy. See, some of us believe, just like the nation of Israel, the key to happiness is stuff. It's stuff, it's material possessions, or it's, it's status. You want a job title that you're proud to say when you are in groups of people, because it will give you significance. You value stuff, you want to drive the car you want to drive, you want to live in the apartment complex you want to live in, you want to go ahead and buy a house now. You want stuff. You want season tickets to the maps. You want your own stuff. That's where happiness is found. For others of you, the key to happiness is security. So, man, you're saving all your money because when you look at your bank account, like there's safety and security there. When you, when you look at how your 401k is accumulating money, there's security there. Or if you could just get a spouse, then you would feel safe and secure that you're not going to be single for forever. And for others, the key to happiness is it's man-made religion. It's you just figuring out what makes you feel good about yourself. So you know what? I go to the porch on Tuesday night because I just, I just feel better about myself after I go. You know what? I, I read that latest pastor's book and, and I, it's kind of, I'm doing that instead of reading my Bible, but it's kind of the same thing because there's Bible verses in it. And so really that makes me feel better about myself. It's man-made religion. Maybe you're a follower of Jesus Christ, but in your time with God, time with God is you um, just, it, it's you feeling better, like you're a better person than, than other people. So you spend your time with God and then you go out and you feel like you are crushing life in a way that others aren't. So your time with God is more about your image than it is about intimacy with God. And so you know what we're doing? We're taking God's gifts, because these aren't bad things. 401Ks, they're good things. You should save, people. Driving a car, not a bad thing. You're probably going to need one. These things aren't bad in and of themselves. You know where they go bad is when we take God's gifts and we turn them into God's. That is what we tend to do. We take good things and we make them ultimate things. And we switch places with God. We have to understand that to try to be God or to replace God is to be against God. There isn't a form of Christianity where it is acceptable to God for us to function like one pastor said, Christian atheists. What's a Christian atheist? A Christian atheist is someone who gets their ticket into heaven and they call themselves a Christian and yet they live like they don't know Jesus, the one who will be exalted over all the earth. And so we try and be God or we try and replace God. That is Christian atheism. 
Several years ago, um, we made plans to take our boys to Legoland in California. So Legoland, it's, it's this great amusement park. It's just built out of Legos. Like, it's crazy. It's amazing. It's a, it's a dream for a five-year-old boy. So we were planning to go to Legoland. We were going in about two to three weeks, and we were living in Austin at the time. We went into the Barton Creek Mall, if you've ever been there. And in Barton Creek, there was a Lego store. So we went into the Lego store, and my son Noah, who was about five years old at the time, he saw this Lego keychain, and he was like, Dad, can I have the Lego keychain? I was like, hey, dude, here's the deal. In like two, three weeks, we're going to Lego Land. Not Lego store, Lego Land. And you can get whatever you want then. But Dad, I want the Lego keychain now. And this was not the best parenting. I'm just going to own it from now. Like I was just kind of thinking on the spot. And when you're a parent, you know what parenting is? Parenting is having no clue what to do and just trying your best. That's what parenting is. So in the moment, here's what I said. I was like, hey, man, here's the deal. We can either go to Lego land. You can get whatever you want. Or you can get this keychain, we can cancel going to Lego Land. <laughs> it was a bluff, people. It was a bluff. I wouldn't have canceled the trip. You know what he said? I'll take the keychain. I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> but do you know what Noah was saying? He was saying, this is what I need most. And yet, me, his dad, I had a perspective that he didn't have. I knew what was waiting for him. I knew all of the beauty, all of the greatness, all of the enjoyment that waited for him, but in his mind, this is what he needed now. And so when a five-year-old does that with Legoland, we chalk it up to youth. But when adults do that with God, when God has given us his word, and what has he declared to us in his word? There is no other God but me. In my presence, there is fullness of joy. At my right hand are pleasures forevermore. I came that you might have life and have it to the full. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And yet we're like, you know what? But you know what? I'm going to find my life in this stuff or in this person or in this thing or in this status. When it's a five-year-old with Legoland, that's youth. When it's an adult doing that with God, that's pride. It's pride. And so my encouragement to us is that we would humble ourselves before we are humbled. Because look at what Isaiah chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 say. It says this, so man is humbled. Each one is brought low. Do not forgive them. Enter into the rock and hide in the dust from before the terror of the Lord and from the splendor of his majesty. The haughty looks of man shall be brought low. The lofty pride of men shall be humbled. The Lord alone will be exalted in that day. It's interesting because what Isaiah is saying is, look, you've looked for life and you have made gods out of things in the material world. So because that's where you looked for life, that's where you're gonna have to look to hide when the majesty and splendor melts everything away and all you see is God exalted above the earth. So his point is come now. Humble yourselves now. Don't wait to be humbled. Humble yourselves now under the mighty hand of God. When Jesus comes back, we will have one of two responses, either worship or shame. We will either worship him because that's what we've already been doing. We've already seen him for who he is, the one true God. And so we've lived lives of worship. And when he comes back, our worship just intensifies. Or we're going to experience shame because we're going to realize that we spent our lives worshiping the wrong gods. And so let me just ask, where do we go from here? 
What I'm trying to do is I'm not trying to beat us over the head tonight. I'm trying to drive us towards humility. I'm trying to drive us towards sight for us to open up our eyes to not just live for today, but to live for eternity, to not just live for today, but to live for that day. Jesus is coming back. It's not a question of if, it's a matter of when. We don't know. So one of the, you know what the greatest form of pride is? It's to say, well, it won't be today. And it won't be tomorrow. And so I'll figure it out someday. That's the greatest form of pride. Because what you're saying is, I know that I'm fine until I decide to get right with God. When my kids were young, I'd take them to the grocery store with me. And you've seen these shopping carts, but grocery stores have shopping carts that are race cars which are amazing. Always get the race cars if you've got kids like two or three years old. So you put your kid in the car and there's a steering wheel there and they sit there and drive while you are pushing them through. Now I want you to think about this. Imagine what it would be like in the grocery store if there was actually power to those steering wheels. Can you imagine the madness, the chaos when little toddlers have their way. Now, thankfully, there is no power to those steering wheels and there is a good parent who's in control running the show. See, we all have to come to a realization that there is a difference between who we think we are and who we actually are. Who we think we are is we think that we're God, that we're in control, that we can figure life out on our own that if there's power to the steering wheel, we can flourish. But who we actually are is we're the toddler in the shopping cart and left to ourselves. We're broken. What we all have to do is we have to look back and we have to see that there is a good, perfect father who is directing our lives. And his son Jesus has come to restore us into right relationship with the Father. Why? So that we can live life with Him. Humility is the key to eternity. So if you're here tonight and you don't know Jesus Christ, then my encouragement to you tonight is to make a decision to seek out the truth. Not your truth. The truth. Seek it out. Go on a relentless search until you find the truth. And I believe you will find the truth in Jesus Christ. Humble yourself. Make the decision. You don't have it all figured out. That's okay. None of us do. But find the truth. If you're here and you consider yourself a Christian, I'm not trying to cause anyone to doubt their salvation. I'm just trying to have a clarifying conversation with a few people in the room. If you call yourself a Christian and yet yet you spend your days trying to be God or replace God, all I want to do is I want to invite you to humble yourself and repent tonight. And I want to invite you to see Jesus clearly. Who is our Jesus? Jesus is the one who humbled himself. Philippians 2 says that he humbled himself and took the, the, he became a servant and he died. He died in our place. He humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. And after his death, he walked out of a tomb. Therefore, he has been highly exalted and he has the name which is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee would bow and every tongue would confess that he is Lord. That's who he is. I'm inviting you tonight to repent, to turn from your ways of being God or replacing God and turn to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords and fully surrender to him. And finally, if you have a real and intimate, enjoyable relationship with Jesus Christ, then my encouragement to you is is just continually identify the things that that threaten to, to compete with God's place in your life. 
even right now, just identify who or what are you sensing you need more than you need Jesus. And whatever it is, just turn that over to the Lord and invite him to, to do a new work in your life. Ask him to give you eyes to see him more clearly so that he would be exalted in your life. And then I would just leave you with the words of John the Baptist. John the Baptist says in John 3.30, these are words to live by. He says, he must increase, but I must decrease. That's humility. That's coming to the realization of not who you think you are, but who you actually are. That you've been made to worship him, and he is the exalted one over all creation. He must increase, but I must decrease. Let's pray together. Lord, if there's anyone in this room tonight who doesn't know you, then my hope and prayer, even in this moment, is that they would sense that you are reaching into their lives, opening up their eyes so that they can see you clearly, Lord Jesus. I pray that there would be someone tonight who would put their trust in you. And if that's you, if you're here tonight and you're just saying, yeah, I wanna say yes to Jesus, if that's you, just right where you are, just pray in the quietness of your own heart. Say, Lord Jesus, I want you to be exalted in my life. Thank you that you died for me. Thank you that you rose from the dead for me. Would you come into my life? Would you forgive me of my sins? Would you begin to lead me in a new life? And for the rest of us, I just want to invite you to do business with the Lord in the quietness of your own heart. Like the, maybe the worst thing you could do right now is just rush out or to quickly respond by singing. Maybe you just need to do business with him. Maybe you need to confess where you have exalted other people or other things, where you've tried to play God in your own life, and you just need to ask for forgiveness. You need to experience his grace. Whatever he's doing in your life, respond to him now. Lord Jesus, we need you. We love you. Be exalted in this place for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name.